thank Brother Williams for the invitation and thank the, the committee for the fine work that they've done so far. <clears throat> and I'd just like to get right into my lesson. The subject of my lesson, as he said, was we are always one generation from falling away. Think about that now. We're always one generation from falling away. For the purpose of this lesson, a generation is 40 years. Now, that could be questioned depending on when you was born and when your first uh, child was born. But for this lesson, a generation is going to be 40 years. <clears throat> Let me give you a little background here. <clears throat> the Israelites are camped along the east banks of the Jordan River at the very edge of the Promised Land. And they are, they are completing the mourning period for Moses, who had just died, Deuteronomy 34, 7 and 8, 39 years earlier, after spending a year at Mount Sinai, receiving God's law, the Israelites had an opportunity to enter the promised land, but they failed to trust God to give them victory. As a result, God did not allow them to enter the land, but made them wander in the wilderness until the disobedient, disobedient generation had died. Those people that was disobedient to God had died. During their wilderness wandering, the Israelites obeyed God, obeyed his laws. They also taught the new generation to obey God's laws. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the things that we have to do as Christians, as mothers and as fathers. We have to teach the young people so that they might enter the promised land. All the children grow, and as they grew, they were often reminded of the faith and obedience to, that God brought victory, while unbelief and disobedience brought tragedy. When the last of the older generation had died, and a new generation had become adults, the Israelites prepared to make their long-awaited claim on the promised land. After wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, a new, a new generation is ready. A new generation is ready to enter the promised land. But first, first, God prepares both their leader, Joshua, and the nation by teaching them the importance of courageous and consistent faith. The nation then miraculously crosses the Jordan River to begin the long-awaited conquest of a promised land. Now, like Joshua, we too need faith in order to begin and continue living the Christian life. Now, we see here that Joshua was Moses' successor. What special qualifications did Joshua have for this job? Well, first of all, God appointed him. Numbers 27, 18 through 23. He was one of the only two living eyewitnesses to the Egyptian plagues and the exodus from Egypt. He was Moses' personal assistant for 40 years. Of the 12 spies, he and Caleb showed complete confidence that God would help them in the conquest of the land. Now, because Joshua had assisted Moses for many years, he was well prepared to take over the leadership of the nation. We have to understand that changes in leadership are common in many organizations in the church is no exception. <clears throat> As such, a smooth transition is essential in the establishment of new administrations. That's some of the problems that we have in the church. 
Now this doesn't happen unless new leaders are trained. If you are currently in a leadership position, begin to train, begin to train and prepare someone to take your place. Then when you leave, there will be qualified people to carry on their work efficiently. Now, if you desire to be a leader, brothers, if you desire to be a leader, step up and learn from others so you will be ready when the opportunity presents itself. Don't just sit around and keep the peers warm, brothers. Step up, step up and do something. By faithfully obeying the Lord, Joshua led Israel as they finally entered and took control of the promised land promised to their ancestors. Genesis 12, 7 and Exodus 3, 16 and 17. Now under Joshua's leadership and God's strength, the Israelites had accomplished many things, but facing spiritual challenges was more difficult. The unholy but attractive lifestyle of the Canaanites proved more dangerous than their military might. Canaan's greatest threat to Israel was not military power, but religion. Canaanite religion was, they idolized evil traits, cruelty in war, sexual immorality, selfish greed and materialism. It was a me first, anything goes society. Obviously, the religion of Israel and Canaan could not coexist. Amen. Does that sound like something that's happening today? Everything goes. When the Israelites first entered the promised land, Joshua, uh, the book of Joshua, uh, chapter 1 through 12, they united as one army, crushing the inhabitants until they were too weak to retaliate. Notice they, re they united and they were able to accomplish the job. Then after the land was divided among 12 tribes, Joshua chapters 13 to 24, each tribe was responsible for clearing out the remaining enemies from its own territory. Now when we get to the book of Judges, it tells us that they're of their failure to do so. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, Judges 2 and verse number 7. Now, some tribes were more successful than others under Joshua. They all began strong, but soon most were sidetracked by fear, weariness, lack of discipline, or pursuit of their own interests. As a result, their faith began to fade away, and every man did which was right in his own eyes. Joshua 17 and verse number six. In order for our faith to survive, Brothers and sisters, it must be lived day by day. It must penetrate every aspect of our lives. Beware of starting strong and then getting sidetracked from your purpose, which is loving God and living for Him. Once their faith began to fade, they started to disobey God's instructions and doing crazy stuff. For instance, they cut off the thumbs and toes of Anna Bazisky to humiliate, to humiliate him and make him inefficient in battle. But according to the law and God's instruction for conquering the land, they were supposed to kill him. They conquered Jerusalem, but failed to occupy it until the days of David, 2 Samuel 5, 6 through 10. One generation died and the next generation did not follow God. Judges 2, 10 through 3, 7. Each generation failed to teach the next generation to love and follow God. Yet, this was the very center of God's law. This was the very center of God's law. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. The Bible says here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I commend thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children, and shalt talk of them when they sitteth in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou lieth down, and when thou sittest up. In other words, it is our responsibility as parents, as mothers and fathers to teach our children the gospel. If we don't teach them, somebody else will. All kind of things are out there on social media. Don't let that social media be the teachers of your children. Don't do that. We've got all kind of things out there now. We've got telephone church. We've got all kinds of things. People are communing on social media. People are giving on social media. Brothers and sisters, it's high time that we stop this by training our children and giving them a foundation that they can stand on. And when all of this mess comes along, they won't be addicted to it. I'm telling you, it is horrible out there. It really is. Now, in tempting to leave, uh, it is tempting to leave the job of teaching Christian faith to the church or to Christian schools. Yet, God says that the greatest responsibility for this task belongs to the family because children learn so much by example. Faith must be a family matter. That means, first of all, that the family's got to be set up right. The family's got to have a head, not just a pair of pants, but a Christian head. Somebody that knows the scripture, somebody that can teach and raise a family. Then the, these children won't be addicted to these iPads and these PCs and to these telephones and everything else that's out there. They'll know what they're supposed to do. Soon after Joshua died, Israel began to slip away from God. Although Joshua was a great commander, the people missed his spiritual leadership even more than his military skills. For he had kept the people focused on God and his purpose. Joshua had been an obvious, the obvious successor to Moses, but there was no obvious successor to Joshua. We've always got to have somebody waiting in the wings to take over. During this crisis of leadership, Israel needed to learn <clears throat> that no matter how powerful and wise the current leader was, its real leader was God. We cannot overstress the importance of proper leadership in the church. I'm telling you, the church, the problems that we're having, first of all, is because we don't have it set up right. We don't have it set up right. If you set up a congregation the way the Bible says it's supposed to be set up, you know what you can do? You can still have a striving, growing church that is loving and Christian-like. It can be done. We often focus our hope and confidence on some influential leader, failing to realize that in reality, it is God who is in command. We need to acknowledge God as our commander in chief, regardless to what the Supreme Court says, regardless to what the president said. Our commander in chief is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and avoid the temptation of relying too heavily on human leaders, regardless of their spiritual wisdom. Judges 2, 11 through 14. This generation of Israelites abandoned the faith of their parents and began to worship God, the gods of their neighbors. Now, many things can tempt us to abandon what we know is right. The desire to be accept, accepted by our neighbors can lead us into behavior that is unacceptable to God. Don't be pressured into disobedience. 
Judges 2, 12 through 15. God often saved his hardest criticism and punishment for those who worshiped idols. Why was idol worship so bad in God's sight? Well, to worship idols violated two of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, 3 through 6. The Canaanites had gods for every season, activity, or place. To them, the Lord was just another god to be added to their collection of gods. Israel, by contrast, was to worship only the Lord. They could not possibly believe God was the one true God and at the same time bow to an idol. Idol worshipers could not see their gods as their creators. Why? Because they themselves had created them. These idols represent sensual, carnal, and immoral aspects of human nature. God's nature is spiritual and moral. Adding the worship of idols to the worship of God could not and should not be tolerated. And you know what? We do the same thing today. We talk about how bad the Israelites were when they were uh, worshiping idols, and we worship things today. We worship our cars, our homes, and our buildings, and everything else, our television sets, football teams, and athletes, and everything else. We'll sit there and watch a football game in lieu of, of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. So don't say that they were so bad. They were just people like we are. Don't fool around and start worshiping idols because if you do, God's going to give you double punishment. Joshua 2, verses 12 through 14. God was angry with Israel and allowed them to be punished by their enemies. You know what? Anger in itself is not sin. God's anger was the reaction of his holy nature in sin. One side of God's nature is his anger against sin. The other side is his love and mercy towards sinners. Hate the sin, but love the sinner. Hate the sin, but love the sinner. Hate those homosexual things that they do, but love the homosexuals. Love the people. Hate the sin and, and love the sinner. <clears throat> now, we cannot appreciate God's mercy without understanding his fierce wrath. Despite Israel's disobedience, God showed his great mercy by providing judges to save the people from their oppressors. Now, throughout this period of history, you know what? Israel went through seven cycles of rebelling against God being over, turned, overthrown and, un, and overrun by enemy nations, being delivered by a God-fearing judge, remaining loyal to God under that judge and again forgetting God when the judge died. Joshua 2, 16 through 19. You know what, we tend to follow the same cycle, remaining loyal to God as long as we are near those who are devout to him. But when we are on our own, the pressure to draw away from God increases. It's not uncommon to see a preacher tipping in and out of a liquor store and standing outside with a dime scratching. He's out there by himself. He ain't there with the congregation. So you've got to be real with this. We tend to follow the same cycle remaining loyal to God as long as we are near those who are devout to him. Why would the people of Israel turn away so quickly from their faith in God? Simply put, the Canaanite religion appeared more attractive and offered more short-range benefits. Why do you think people are falling away from the Church of Christ in droves? Things out there in the world are more attractive to them. They can see more benefit in it. They can do that because they don't have a good spiritual foundation. We have got to stop, stop just getting people wet. We've got to stop, stop preaching baptism. We've got to start, start 
preaching Christ in him crucified. Boy, if you've got somebody that's crucified with Christ, you've got a Christian. If you've got somebody that's just wet, you've got yourself a problem. Don't be so hasty to get someone in the water. Make sure that they know and understand what the Bible says about their spirituality. One of its most attractive features was that the people could remain selfish and yet fulfill their religious requirements. They could do almost anything they wished and still obey at least one of the Canaanite laws or gods. Sex outside of marriage. Marriage. Brother touched on that this morning. Selfishness. Oppression of the helpless. They were not, they were not only allowed but encouraged as a form of worship. We do the same thing today. We'll ride by those homeless people out there on the street and won't even blink an eye. Won't even blink an eye. We'll talk about what they did, did to be homeless. You know what? They got a soul too. We need to spend some time with them and other people who are interested in, in soul saving and stop so much arguing among ourselves. The miraculous parting of the Red Sea is mentioned many times in the Old Testament. It's mentioned in Exodus 14, Joshua 24, Nehemiah 9, Psalm 74, 106, and 136. The story of this incredible miracle was handed down from generation to generation, reminding the Israelites of God's power, protection, and love. Brothers and sisters, we should continue to preach and teach the gospel to every creature. We need to continue to teach the death, the burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to do it continually. Everybody needs to understand that, and we need to remind them of that each and every day. People need to know that Christ suffered, bled, and died on the cross at Calvary that they might have salvation. They need to know that. We need to remind them of that frequently. Psalms, Psalm 78, the people of Israel rebelled and refused to give their hearts to God. 78, 8, they forgot about God's miracles. 78, 11, and 12, they selfishly complained. 78, 18, they made empty promises to repent and they were ungrateful. 78, 42. Now, this is recorded in God's word so that we can avoid, uh, we can avoid the same areas. The same errors. There ain't no reason why we should do the same thing that they did over again. So these things are recorded in the Bible so we can avoid the same error. Now Paul helps us out in 1 Corinthians the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 10. He said, moreover, brethren, uh, verses 1 through 5, I'm sorry. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the clouds and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock and that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Psalm 78 and 5, as I conclude the lesson, you know what? God commanded that these stories of his mighty acts in, Israel, in Israel's history and his law be passed down from parent to children. This shows the purpose and importance of religious education to help each generation to obey God and to set their hope on him. Brothers and sisters, it is important to keep children from repeating the same mistakes of their ancestors. 
So as you sat there this evening as church leaders, what are you doing? What are you doing to pass on the history of God's work in the world to the next generation? Brothers and sisters, we're only going to be as successful in the church as we make ourselves. It is our responsibility and our duty to God to make sure that we pass on to the next generation God's word. Now, in order to do that, we're going to have to create an atmosphere that people will be happy to come and receive what we have to offer. When people look at us, arguing among ourselves. They don't want no part of that. We have to create an atmosphere so people will come to our Bible classes so we can teach them. We have to create an atmosphere so people will come to our worship services. And when they do come to our worship services, we need to preach to them Christ and him crucified. We don't need to be preaching this philosophy and all of this stuff that the world would have us to preach. We need to love one another. We need to love one another. We need to love one another so we can have the type of love that would cause me to feel something for Brother, Brother Motris if he's sick. He don't have to tell me if he's sick. If I know Brother Mochi and love him, I can look at him and tell that he's sick. He don't have to ask me to give him something he needs. I'll ask him if I love him because I can see that he needs it. Brothers and sisters, we need to stop. We need to stop sitting around here on our high horses acting like that we are more righteous than anybody else. You have sinned too. You are sinning now. Don't think like that you're any better than your neighbor. What I'm saying don't just apply to your neighbor, it applies to you too. We have got to get out of these buildings and take the gospel to a dying world. Fathers and mothers, we have got to take these electronic devices away from our children. They used to be addicted on crack cocaine. Now they are addicted on these electronic devices and every minute of every day they spend with their heads buried in them. We have got to start teaching them what thus saith the Lord. Not only that, but you know what? We got to drink our own water. Oh, that brother wrote a good message, didn't he? We got to drink our own water. Our children have got to be able to see Christ in us. They've got to be able to, to see how that father loves his wife and how that mother loves her husband. They've got to see that man get up and go to work in the morning and bring his paycheck home. And if, if so be because they got so many things that wife's got to go to work, they got to see that too. But let me say this in closing. Brothers and sisters, don't have so many things. Don't have so many things that you don't have no time to spend with those children and teach them. Don't let the daycare centers raise your children. You're just going to wind up with some daycare junkies. They won't know anything about God's word. When those things come along in the world, they'll follow them because that's all they know. You haven't taught them anything. They're not bad children. They just don't know any better. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, the time is come. Look around you. Can you see what's happening? The Bible is right. Do you know now that sweet is bitter and bitter is sweet? Black is white and white is black? Yes is no and no is yes. Brothers, I'm telling you, 
the time has come. The day is here. We have got to do what God has asked us to do as Christians. Give your children a chance. If you don't, they're building a cell down there right now for them. Love them enough to keep them out of themselves. Love them enough to remove those electronic devices. Now, I'm not saying take them away from them completely, but what I am saying is control them. Control them. Live a good life in front of your children so they'll have an example to follow. That's what God has done for us here in this lesson. He has given us an example of of physical Israel that we need to use as spiritual Israel. Physical Israel was God's chosen people. Now we're spiritual Israel. We're God's people. We need to train our children so that they won't fall. Brothers and sisters, believe me when I say so. We're just one generation from falling. We've already lost one or two generations. Whatever we do, let us not lose another one. Thank you so much for your undivided attention, and I hope I've said something that will cause you to think most seriously about your soul salvation. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's, I've been delighted to give a little insight on what thus saith the Lord. message. Our next speaker will be Brother Brigham from uh, Houston, Globe Land Congregation. Uh, he is, uh, he's been preaching 25 years. Okay. 25 years and he's married with wife Tammy, daughter Renata, 